for coming out on a cool Monday evening, especially during the holiday season. I really appreciate it. Um, I haven't ever done one of these state of the school addresses before, but I've been telling people it's sort of like the President's State of the Union address. So once a year, you get to be in front of your crowd and, and talk a little bit about uh, the school, or in his case, the country. Uh, I have to tell you, I stole the idea from someone who is in the room tonight who delivers uh, this once every year, and that's George Moore from Dawson. So he's here to give moral support tonight. So we're, I thank you for that, George. Um, and I really have a pretty simple agenda for us this morning. Uh, I'd like to reflect a little, or this evening, I'd like to reflect a little bit on this school year, uh, talk about the preparations we've already made for next school year, and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, strategic planning for the future of our school. And that's sort of a five to seven year window. Maybe. Got it. Okay. And then at the end, we'll have a little bit of a Q&A. My hope is I'll talk for about 45 minutes and then uh, leave just a few minutes for questions at the end. So uh, a little bit on this school year. I won't keep this slide up for, for very long. Uh, but I have several things that, I, that I'd love to share with you. First of all are some of the goals and initiatives that uh, we had at the beginning of the year. Uh, some of those goals and initiatives we've already implemented, and some of them uh, are still to come. Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about our recent ACIS visit and some of the takeaways from our visiting team. Talk a little bit about enrollment, uh, some of the fundraising work that we've done so far, and then I want to share with you some feedback, some recent feedback from Boulder Country Day's class of 2010. So these are the students that have just graduated from high school this past May. So first up, uh, goals and initiatives. I want to start with, uh, with this slide here. This is from the Athenian Oath, for those of you who know your history, and it reads, we will ever strive for the ideals and sacred things of this city, both alone and with many. We will unceasingly seek to quicken the sense of public duty. We will revere and obey the city's laws, and we will transmit this city not only less, but greater, better, and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. So at, at the beginning of every school year, this is what I reflect back on. How can we improve our school? How can we improve the educational experience uh, that our children are getting uh, year after year after year? And it's a continual process. You never quite reach perfection because the, the next thing is here and you have to go and get it. Uh, so as we reflect back on this year and plan for our future, I want to keep that in mind. That this is a school improvement process and that our ultimate goal is to transmit this place uh, not only greater, but better and more beautiful than we found it. So when we started out at the beginning of the school year, uh, we have four major initiatives. Uh, the first one is to support excellence in our faculty and staff. We want to be able to improve our ability to differentiate our instruction. We want to be sure that we expand the breadth and depth of our educational program. We want to provide the resources that our faculty and staff need to accomplish these goals. And then the fifth one uh, is sort of the still to come this year piece that I'll talk about in just a second. But let me start with the first. I tell people all the time, my most important job is to hire great people. Hire great people. If I can hire great teachers, if I can hire great staff, if I can hire great leaders within the school, then our school will flourish. And so this is what I focus on when I think about supporting excellence in our faculty and staff. And there was a Wall Street Journal article, article written by Dana Goldstein that I shared with some of you, I think, back in September. Uh, she wrote it on September 4th. And she said, there are four qualities of great teachers, and I would say four qualities of great people, great school people in particular. Number one, they have to have active intellectual lives outside of the school. Number two, they have to believe that intelligence is achievable. It's not inborn. Number three, these folks are data-driven. They want to see data. They want to see results. They want to recalibrate their teaching or their work based on that. And number four, they've got to be able to ask great questions. Got to be able to ask great questions. 
And so when I look for people at our school, these are the qualities that I'm looking for. And our folks have those qualities here. Uh, and part of what I have to do is provide them with what they need to be able to do these four things, to be able to have an intellectual, an active intellectual life, to ask great questions. And the, the key to that for me um, is not just offering a robust compensation package, but it's also offering a robust professional development program. This past year, we spent just about $40,000 on professional development for our faculty and staff um, with really, really remarkable programs. We had uh, about one quarter of our teachers take part, of our faculty and staff, sorry, take part in meaningful professional development away from campus. That doesn't include work that they've done in campus uh, or in other schools, okay? So everything from Orton Gillingham training to uh, Marketing Institute down in South Carolina, uh, Orton Gillingham training, I'm sorry, is a, is a, a way of teaching literacy. Uh, Marketing Institute down in South Carolina, CU Science Discovery Workshops, uh, you name it, and we try and get our people out there. Uh, Alexander Technique Training, uh, which is a technique that people uh, who do repetitive tasks uh, use so that their bodies don't become too uh, overtaxed. So musicians uh, who practice day after day after day in that one uh, single pose would use that. Um, ORF instrument training, you name it, and we try and do it for our faculty and staff. These folks are really, really dedicated to improving themselves, uh, and everything they do to improve themselves benefits our children in the long run. Uh, professional development also takes place on a division-wide basis. Uh, for example, in our elementary school, we've been working for four years now, Kath and Phil, three or four years with Kathy, Kathy King Dippin. Three years with a consultant named Kathy King Dickman. She's a literacy consultant. And she comes into our classrooms, she observes our teachers, she gives them feedback on how they can enrich their lessons a little more um, actively. She works with our faculty as a whole in after school workshops. She comes in five times a year. The next time she'll be in here is in January. Uh, if you haven't met her uh, when she's in school, she's also called uh, Mrs. Dynamite because she's just that type of personality. So that's an example of division-wide professional development. Another example would be in the middle school, um, we just a few weeks ago uh, spent the day in IB training. And the central uh, message for us was IB is changing its way of assessment. And what they are beginning to do is move away from um, sort of the assessment that uh, we might have been used to when we were in school, when you wrote an English essay and the teacher put on the top of the page, B plus. That was it. So you got to see the grade and you weren't quite sure what was going on. Uh, IB wants to take the mystery away from them. They're asking all of our teachers to literally identify exactly what it takes to get an A. It's the age old question. What do I have to do to get an A? IB is now helping us define that. So our teachers spent a full day, uh, half the teachers in, in the morning and the other half in the afternoon in an IB workshop. So we do those types of things by division. Then we do some uh, school-wide professional development. And most recently, um, that work has focused on some equity and inclusivity training. So we have a, a fantastic group of people here at school, and we want to make sure that our school community is ready for the time when we accept all kinds of folks from the broader Boulder community. We've done wonderful workshops in the beginning of the school uh, where we uh, participated in something called the Curriculum on the Walls, for example. And what that workshop does is it asks you to consider how are you representing yourselves on the walls of your school. So if you were to look around our gym, you can see flags from different countries from which our families come. What does that say about us? as a school. How is that reflected in our curriculum? Uh, we're going to have another half-day workshop in January with some folks, um, one of whom is from, the, our facilitators are two people, one from Naropa University, another one from New Vista High School in town. Um, and we are going to start to take some of the equity and inclusivity work we have done and push it down directly into the classroom so we know how we can become more equitable and inclusive uh, as a community. So that's an example of school-wide professional development. The second thing we want to do is, is improve our ability to differentiate uh, within our school. And we have relatively small class sizes compared to the rest of the Boulder Valley. So I've talked to a number of teachers 
uh, recently, uh, we've just been hiring for a seventh grade position, and I've talked to a number of teachers, and I said, what are the, you know, what are the kinds of class sizes that you're working with? Um, 32 in a fifth grade, a visit to Fairview High School last week to talk about math class and alignment of our math curriculum with the Boulder Valley School District, 27 to 42 students in a class. We have a luxury of having a class size of half, more than half that, less than half that, sorry. And, um, and we need to be able to be sure that we can di differentiate our instruction both in the classroom and also with our learning specialists so that each individual student is getting what he or she needs. So we've done a whole bunch of work in this area. We've redesigned our learning center this year so that we can have a, uh, we've staffed it up. We've redesigned it so that we have our learning center professionals who are now pushing into classrooms as well as pulling students out of classrooms uh, in groups. Um, we've been able to support what's called a flooding program in K-2 elementary education. We take our entire learning center staff uh, in the morning right after the start of school at 8.15 and we push them all into the kindergarten classroom. So instead of one teacher and 15 students <coughs> or uh, all told three teachers and 30 students, we have seven teachers and 30 students. So we can work often in groups of two, three, four, five to one. This allows every single student to receive direct instruction from a teacher on a daily basis. It's going to make a tremendous difference in our kids' lives as they progress through our educational system. Um, give you another example of uh, the types of things that we've been able to start this year. Uh, in our preschool, we wanted to be sure that we expanded our preschool for um, future enrollment. So we decided we would offer parenting classes for two-year-olds. And Kath Porter has been offering, uh, she offered one class in the fall, she's going to offer another one in the winter, uh, fully enrolled of parents with two-year-olds who are then thinking about coming to, to BCD down the line. We've also opened a three-year-old class in preschool uh, that will start January 6th. These are for children who are turning three after our guiding date, which is about September 30th. So these are children after September 30th, before about January 31st. They need preschools as well. So we've opened a mid-year preschool class that we're uh, very, very fortunate. We think we're going to have uh, between seven and eight students in that class. Uh, also in elementary school, we're grouping by ability in math uh, in our different grade levels. So we have small groups within the classroom. We also use our learning center staff to take some students outside the classroom so we can more uh, we can meet their individual needs more effectively. We've been able to <coughs> redesign our elementary report card. Hopefully all of you got that at the end of the first trimester. That's now standards and goal based as opposed to grade based. So you understand that if your child is progressing towards a standard, if they're at standard, or if they're not making progress towards a standard. It's a much more effective way to assess kids and their progress. In middle school this year, we started a middle school orientation program to help our fifth graders transition into sixth grade. And um, it's, it had tremendous effect on making sure that our kids are able to, to handle uh, the rigors of our middle school program. We have a one-to-one -one program in the middle school, as you know. So making sure that our kids are able to transition seamlessly is critically important in the middle school. We have also revamped our Middle School Explore program. And for those of you who don't know, middle school has six uh, what you would consider academic periods a day, English, history, math, science, world languages, and then we uh, flip-flop STEM and Latin, so they meet every other day in middle school. Then we have two enrichment periods per day. We call them Explore. You might think of them as your college elective programs. Uh, we've been able to uh, redesign that program so we have a tremendous amount of, of choice in the morning. Everything from painting miniatures with Adam Evgen, sixth grade, seventh grade boys are all over painting these tiny little miniatures, like 20 kids in this class. Uh, it's fascinating to watch Adam teach that. Uh, to uh, digital uh, graphic design, to all kinds of other different arts courses, etc. In the afternoon, we're providing a foundation in some of our core electives, a foundation in arts, foundation in music. We have a health and PE program that we've started for this very first year. So now every student in the school, and especially our middle schoolers, are receiving health education. They have, we haven't done that before. So this is an example of how we're sort of changing our curriculum to meet our needs. Um, and last but not least in the middle school, every middle schooler this year and 
uh, hereafter will participate in a coding program. Uh, this was generously funded by a, a family who wanted us to be able to do this kind of initiative. Coding is, um, it's, it's, a, it's a program that's not like I remember it in college. So I don't know how many of you ever took Fortran in college, but it was, a, it was brutal getting through Fortran. Uh, used to be called computer science. Well now, uh, it's much more accessible. So our kids are able to code in a program called Scratch, and it's object-oriented to just pull coding pieces into the program and make all kinds of different things happen. To me, it's important, not just because we're teaching coding or computer science, but we're teaching other skills that we know our kids need. We know they need to learn how to problem solve. We know they need to learn how to organize an, uh, an essay or a computer program. It's almost the same way. You gotta start with the beginning and end with the conclusion. And if, in coding, if it doesn't line up, the program's not gonna work. So it's helping to teach our kids these transferable skills that I think are really, really important for them in other parts of our curriculum. Um, so we're thrilled to be able to do that. The seventh graders have already done it. The eighth graders are in it now. The sixth graders will do it at the end of this semester. Every year we'll add a next level to the coding. So hopefully by the time our students graduate from eighth grade, if they've been with us all three years, they'll have had three solid trimesters of coding, uh, which I think is a, is a differentiator for us. Uh, School-wide initiatives as well. I mentioned the health curriculum that I think was so important. Uh, we have an artist in residence program coming up in March that we have funded from a uh, lot, no, lot of funds last year. Uh, we have um, an artist, local artist by the name of Will Day. Anybody know Will? Uh, Will and I went to summer camp together. He's coming in for a week and uh, for a day in March. He's going to work with our kids in a hands-on way. We have a uh, storyteller, musician, those kinds of folks that are able to give our kids hands-on experience on what art is like sort of in the real world, if you will. Uh, can't wait to have it. Uh, and finally, as part of a school-wide initiative, uh, many of you have participated in our parent education series. And this has really been, I think, a, a tremendous asset uh, for you because parenting is complex. And in order to get through this complex world, we need some help. So whether it's from uh, Common Sense Media, who is helping us learn how to be digitally safe in this world and giving us uh, very plain spoken recommendations on which movies our kids can watch and which uh, games our children should be able to play uh, on their uh, iPads or whatnot. Or uh, Patty Wa uh, Gatto Walden, who is a, a woman who knows a lot about giftedness. She talked about the two sided coin of yeah. giftedness. Um, we had a high school fair for the first time, 20 something high schools were in here, 150 people, uh, helping our parents choose what that next level is going to be for their children. In January, we have Rosalind Weissman. If you haven't RSVP'd for that, I would encourage you to do so. She's the author of Queen Bees and Wannabes and Masterminds and Wingmen. So basically, girls growing up, boys growing up. And she can help us negotiate these, uh, these years, especially the middle school years. And then uh, in February, we also have a speaker. Uh, her name is Patty Ashley. Uh, and she, her topic is, is good enough really good enough. And she wrote a book called Living in the Shadow of the Too Good Mother Archetype. And although she calls out mothers in her title, I suspect it's equally good information for fathers as well. So all of this, I hope, is helping us uh, become better at what I want us to be able to do, and that's educate our kids. And whether you're a teacher or a parent, um, I think this provides useful information for us. Last but not least, we've had a group of uh, volunteers this year who've taken on a, a particularly specific initiative. Uh, the folks who are in our PTO have established Kersey's Corner, which is a little PTO store in front of the, uh, in the front lobby of the gym there. And they are uh, keen on really increasing parent engagement and volunteerism at our school. We have tons of people who volunteer in the classroom. We have tons of people who volunteer for events, whether it's a cross-country event or the recent gala. Uh, and the PTO really works with us in partnership uh, to help us make this a better place for our kids. The dues that you pay go right back into the classroom, as you might know, and, um, and they've been tremendous partners. So uh, while I have a moment, I just want to thank the folks on the PTO. Uh, I know Malia is here, who is the president. Malia, are any other folks here? Who's sitting out front? Angela, thank you. Pat, thank you very much.
measure of success for a school, for a day school like ours, is how engaged are our parents. Uh, and to have sort of a bevy of volunteers like we have is, is quite remarkable. Uh, and they're always looking for more, right, Blaine? So please make sure that, that uh, you volunteer if you would like to do so. Uh, last initiative, uh, and the last, I, sh I should say the last goal, is to provide the resources and facility that our faculty and staff need to, to accomplish our goals. And um, what we seek to do is to give our teachers state-of-the-art instructional technology. Uh, we've invested a lot of uh, funds in uh, uh, technology this particular year with either new laptops or tablets for our teachers. Uh, virtually every classroom now and soon every classroom will have uh, either a projector and or a Mimeo board in the classroom so that we can continue to teach our kids the skills that they need. Uh, we're going to make sure that they have access to the technology they need both in the libraries uh, and in their classrooms as well. Uh, right now there's a lot of information that's coming digitally at our students, particularly in terms of digital books. So we're going to be focusing, as I'll mention in a minute, on uh, some uh, e-books for our library and our classrooms. Uh, and we've got to make sure that we have a beautifully well-maintained campus. And uh, while I have him here, if he is still here, but I don't see him. Uh, Craig Gaskell is a guy who works on our campus uh, night and day. He's here tonight. He'll be here over the Christmas break. Uh, he'll be here in just uh, a few months as we think about what we're going to do with the lights in here. I'll mention that in just a minute as well. Uh, he works tirelessly to make sure that this place is clean and maintained and ready for our kids every day. So if you see Craig, on the way out, uh, please give him a thank you because what he does is critically important to the health and success of our school. So let me give you an idea of what's um, still to come this year. Uh, we have been investing a lot of time and effort in a new website and a new student information system. Uh, the website itself we hope will launch after the holidays sometime in January um, and the student information system which is going to be your way that you communicate electronically with the school will launch further down the line. Uh, the website is important because we now know that it is the number one way a new family hears about our school. Number one way. Just today, Susan was talking to two different families, one from France and one from Spain, uh, that want to come to our school. The one from France might even want to start in May with just a few weeks left because they're moving in. And this is how people hear about our school. So we need to be able to have a strong digital presence and we need to be able to make sure that our site is uh, telling folks who we are and that it's easy to navigate and that it is um, a place that, that people want to go also for information. So that will launch in January. You can, uh, you can look forward to that. Another thing, if you are in the middle school, your children will be offered uh, in Explore, a Maker Lab uh, Explore. We've got a new 3D printer and software that we're going to be installing uh, shortly. Uh, it just came in about a week and a half ago, I think. It's, it's still in Gabe Hernan's office. But we're psyched to be able to have this Maker Lab. I think it's a, it's a wave of technology in the future. And the idea that we can have a piece of creative software that you can design something 3D and then print it out on a printer like a, an iPhone or a bottle of water. I think that's pretty cool, and I think our kids are going to love to be able to, to get into that. Uh, recently, the Parent Association uh, PTO funded half of the equipment for our archery program that we're going to start after the holidays. There were seven of us, I think, on Friday night between 5 and 10 who were in this building, right here in the gym, getting trained on how to be an archery instructor. <laughs> so we are going to be starting a program called Olympic Archery in Schools. Uh, it will be part of our middle school PE program. It will al also be offered as an after school program for elementary age students. The middle school piece, we can actually compete against other schools. Uh, and for right now, we're going to have to go to Denver to do that. But hopefully, eventually, we'll have what they're going to call a northern region so that we can compete against other schools. Uh, up here. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, in January we're going to be doing more equity and inclusivity work with our faculty and staff. And I, and I should mention uh, that we had a, a generous BCD family who was inspired by the work that we're doing and is underwriting that entire program for the entire year. Um, so the Gray family uh, is taking care of that for us and we're, we're really grateful for that work. This is some of the most profound professional development I have had in my career. Uh, and I think it's uh, really going to be a remarkable asset for our community. So, a little bit about the 
ACIS visit. Um, this was also a big part of our year. And uh, for those of you who don't know, we spent the entire school year last year writing a self-study. It's an 84-page document that evaluates every single piece of our school, 36 different program areas. And we do this because we seek reaccreditation from the Association of Colorado Independent Schools. And that association is um, recognized by the Colorado Department of Education as an accrediting body. So this is a big deal for us. We were first accredited seven years ago, and now we're up for reaccreditation again. After we wrote the self-study, we send it off to uh, the association, and they appoint an eight-person visiting team comprised of experts from independent schools throughout Colorado. And they spend three and a half days on our campus evaluating what we say we do. And that's a key for independent schools. We're mission driven. So we don't have to do it all, but we've got to do what we say we do. And so what we say we do, we hope, is in our self-study. Uh, they arrived on a Sunday evening or late Sunday afternoon, about 3 o'clock. We had a reception for them on Sunday evening. And they left Wednesday afternoon and literally spent most of the time uh, on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday morning interacting with our faculty and staff. They talked with some alum. They talked with some parents and trustees. Uh, and the end result of their visit is what's called the visiting team report. And that report contains commendations. Here's what you're doing well. Uh, recommendations, here's our areas to explore, and suggestions, here's how you might explore those areas. And I can't share the whole visiting team report with you because it's fresh, but I can share the major commendations and recommendations, so I will do that now. And I'm going to read directly from them just so you get a sense of how the visiting team understood the culture of our school. Major commendations. Number one was change management. The faculty, staff, administration, and trustees should all be congratulated for embracing change, gracefully managing transi uh, transitions, and responding to strategic challenges with clarity, calm, and a sense of purpose. Recent challenges and transitions include the economic recession, a shift away from some of the previous curricular and philosophical approaches, changes in leadership at the board and administrative levels, and the construction of a new brewery right across the street. <laughs> get a sense of humor. Yet the school is currently on stronger footing than at any time in its past. Enrollment has been increasing, expenses are now covered entirely by tuition, leadership is stable, and parent satisfaction is generally strong. So that's number one. Number two is community spirit. The visiting team encountered a community of remarkable collegiality, enthusiasm, and goodwill. Despite the fact that our visit fell amidst submission of grades and comments, the book fair, an open house and sub-zero temperatures, to name a few, the atmosphere of optimism, hospitality, and community pride was tangible. Students, teachers, staff, and parents all expressed appreciation for the opportunity to be a bulldog. BCD is a strong school, well on its way to securely viewing itself as a forever school. And that term forever school is a term that our board of trustees has used for a while. And that's basically a uh, sort of a term that we use when uh, it's been, say, 20 or so years since your founding, and now you're projecting yourself into your future. You've become that stable uh, school that you wanted to become 25 years ago when you thought to yourself, what would this look like 25 years from now? Number three, school image. By all accounts, the school's recent rebranding effort has been a huge success. Name recognition in Boulder is on the rise. There is a noticeable cohesion of image and message around campus and on materials, and school pride is evident. The benefit of this effort will only increase with time as the BCD name and logo continue to find a stronger footing in the market. If you are new to BCD this year and you didn't know us before we had the Bulldog, this was a tremendous effort that started the year before I got here, continued last year, and is continuing this year. And Susan Boyle, who's our director of mission and marketing, is the one who spearheaded that whole effort. So thank you very much. <laughs> and commendation number four was facilities. BCD enjoys a beautiful, well-designed, five-and-a-half-acre campus set next to scenic ponds and open spaces. The school has also taken recent steps to both enhance and protect this terrific asset for generations to come. The campus security plan and improvements are highly effective, culturally appropriate, and relatively unobtrusive. 
Thoughtful planning by the board and administration has also created a healthy PRISM account, I'll explain that in a second, that allows the school to maintain and enhance this unique asset. This level of prudent, forward-thinking planning is admirable. So a PRISM account is basically, um, it's an account that you create and that you fund so that when you need to replace the roof or a water main out front or a boiler, or in New England they call them boilers, or HVAC system, or what have you, you have the funds to do it. So think of it as a capital expenditure savings account, uh, if you will. So those are the four major commendations, change management, community spirit, school image, and facilities. They also gave us major recommendations. The first one is mission clarity. Complete the recent work on articulating the mission and the newly created philosophy statement. Re-examine the term classical as it relates to BCD today and to the emerging vision of its future. Explore alternative language or develop a common interpretation that can unify your community. The present confusion and disagreement on this point merits thoughtful dialogue about fundamental principles and aspirations to achieve greater consensus. Achieving greater clarity in this area will guide strategic planning, enhance a shared sense of purpose, and support internal marketing through consistent messaging. So we have the term classical in our mission. And 17 years ago, it meant something different than it means now. And so we have to go back and look at not just that term, but our mission in general to be sure that we have agreement on the mission of our school, the fundamental purpose of our school across constituencies. Secondly, strategic planning. As a school embarks on strategic, on strategic planning, special emphasis should be given to a few especially pressing topics. Developing strategies to increase financial aid over time. Creating an internal compensation scale matrix that supports equitable compensation with more transparent communications and planning to build an endowment. Each of these suggested project re projects represents a current challenge that hin hinders progress towards greater stability. Clear, compelling messaging around the need for these initiatives will be important in the eventual articulation of the strategic plan. So strategic planning is number two. And the last one's program development. Program development is a very common uh, recommendation for independent schools. In recent years, the school has intentionally shifted away from many of its cardinal roots, adopting a middle school IV model, expanding student support services to enhance differentiation, grown in enrollment, and transitioned to new leadership. There has also been recent re-examination of the school's mission and the creation of the philosophy statement. It's now time for the school to carefully and thoughtfully examine and clarify curricular and scheduling goals and priorities based on these overarching factors. Special attention should be given to aligning middle school allocations of time with prioritized calendar objectives. Uh, the progression of world languages from preschool through eighth grade, I'm sorry, those prioritized curriculum objectives. Progression of world languages from preschool through eighth grade, strengthening the IB curriculum and long term term early childhood enrollment plans. In addition, the quality and alignment of subject area scope and sequence documentation is inconsistent. Where necessary, attention should be given to the creation of cur curricular plans that inform classroom instruction. So when you have a school that cuts across three divisions from preschool through eighth grade, they want to make sure we're aligned, and we should be. So this is a dynamite recommendation that's going to provide us a good deal of uh, energy as we move forward. So, once again, the three recommendations, mission clarity, strategic clar uh, planning, and program development. Each of the 36 sections of the report has commendations, recommendations, and suggestions. It's going to guide our work over the course of the next two to three years, and we're going to marry that with the strategic plan to ensure we have an effective plan for our school's future. So it's a lot of good work by the ACIS uh, visiting team, uh, and for those of you who don't know, Kath Porter and Gabe Hernan were the coordinators of that effort, uh, and they deserve a great round of applause. highest opening day enrollment in our school's history. Uh, last year, 
towards spring, we had about 340 students in our school. I was preparing this report three different times over the last three work days, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And each time I went to Susan Boyle and said, okay, our current enrollment is X. Do I have that right? She would say, no, it's X plus one. <laughs> so our current enrollment as of January 6th will be 348 kids, which is 15 over the start of the school year and at least eight more than, than we've ever had in our school's history. And this is a critically important piece because as you can see behind me, uh, a rising tide lifts all ships. The more students we have in appropriate places in our school without compromising our class size standard, the more resources we have to do what we need to do, and the more we can live into our mission, which ultimately is to help your children discover their excellence. So with 348 students starting uh, January 6th, um, we will be able to preserve all of our class sizes. And for those of you who don't know, we have a class size maximum of uh, Three-year-olds, 12 to two teachers, pre-K, 15 to two. In the elementary school, it's 18 students per class, two classes per grade. And in the middle school, our class sizes have to average 18 with no class bigger than 22. So as long as we can meet those benchmarks, I believe that the more we can attract students to our school <coughs> and families to our school and the community, the more it benefits every single person in this room, even the folks who didn't show up tonight. Um, so this is a tremendous, tremendous uh, piece of news for our school. Uh, Susan, once again, is, is leading the, the uh, work in the admission office, uh, and we're grateful for that. Uh, and we're also grateful for the rest of the folks at our school, including some of you in this room, who help us get to where we need to be. Just tonight, Susan was talking to a family who's uh, asked another or talked to another family about BCD and they're coming to shadow recently. So we're all in the, in the work of enrollment management here and we're uh, led wonderfully by Susan. So congratulations. <laughs> so 348 I think looks like 53 in preschool, 195 in elementary, and 100 in middle school. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like. And I'll talk about next year's enrollment in just a second. And a little about fundraising. As many of you know, we changed our fundraising model this year. Uh, we uh, believe very strongly in our new commitment that uh, tuition ought to cover the cost of your education. And we shouldn't be using the funds we, we raise through our events or through our annual campaign to finance school operations. So this is a critical shift in how we're approaching fundraising. Uh, we started this shift last year, and we sort of said to Julie Griffith, our director of development, this is the direction in which we want to go. Um, lead us there. And she has. So this is, um, this is great stuff. We started out at the, at the beginning of the year uh, raising money uh, in a golf tournament for scholarship and financial aid. Uh, we partnered with the Dawson School. We raised $10,000 for scholarship and financial aid, and we were able to employ that aid immediately uh, into our school year. So we actually have families who are here because of the monies that we raised at the golf tournament. So if you participated in the golf tournament in some way, shape, or form, or the tennis tournament, or the bunco tournament, you're helping to support students at our school. The next piece was uh, BC Gala. Uh, we had that in uh, October, and that is when I announced this new fundraising strategy. We netted $75,000 from our BCD Gala. This is remarkable, especially given the fact that our LADA, which was our last fundraiser, was in March of 2014. So if you are like me and you plan your philanthropy, when you double up in one year, it can be a little challenging. Uh, but we did a great job at the gala, and the $75,000 net, I think, is a, is a testament to the, to the generosity of this community and the vision of this community. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're going to do with some of that money in just a second. And then we launched uh, the BCD fund. Uh, I can tell you uh, that to date the fund uh, has been extremely successful. Right as of today, I think it is, Julie, uh, we are at $75,000 out of a $130,000 goal. That's 60% of the way there. It's up $20,000 over last year at this time, at this very same time. So this message of fundraising for 
uh, above and beyond operations is important and people are getting it. We're not filling a gap. And for those of you who've been uh, asked to, to wait or to give before, uh, you might have heard, we, tuition doesn't cover the entire cost of the education, so we need to fill that gap with operational, I'm, I'm sorry, with fundraising. Uh, and we're not doing it. And it's working. We also participated in the Colorado Gives Day for the first time this year. It was a ton of work to register for that program. They wanted everything from the last three years financial statements to a statement from the chair of the board of trustees, a statement from me, all kinds of different things. What Colorado Gives Day does for me is it creates a sense of a giving and philanthropic community. So the entire state of Colorado is putting their resources to work on that particular day. Um, I think all told we raised about $16,000 on that day. Um, and that was, a, it's, it's wonderful to feel part of something larger than yourselves. So, uh, fundraising for this particular year has been uh, fantastic so far. And I want to show you, or tell you a little bit about, what we're going to do with some of the funds that we raised in our gala. So, every year we ask our faculty and staff, if you had your druthers, what would you, druther, what would you have in your classroom? Uh, and how can you use, what kinds of tools could you use to improve the education uh, of our children? So here's some examples. So if you're in preschool, you can look forward to an outdoor art center. If you are in kindergarten through second grade, your kids can look forward to two things. Uh, instead of laptops in those grades, we're going to have Kindles so that we can do some of our literacy work on the Kindles. You'll also have interactive Mimeo boards so that we can uh, present our teachers, our K2 teachers can have um, the interactive whiteboards like every other teacher in our school has. You are going to be looking at new lights in the gymnasium. This is actually the most expensive of our initiatives. And is Aaron here? I think I saw her come in. Aaron, uh, mom of Quinn and Alexa Sharp, helped us organize this whole thing in here. So beginning in March, I think, these lights are going to be replaced with LED lights. Uh, it's about a $19,000 project, if I'm not mistaken. The return on investment is less than five years. So we can get rid of these mercury lights that take forever to warm up. If you shut them off, you've got 10 minutes before they come back on again. And we'll put, replace them with LED lights, which are off and on right away. Uh, that's great. I mentioned the Olympic archery in schools. We're using ha uh, some gala funds to supplement the uh, funds given to us by the Parent Association to start this program. We're going to buy some band instruments so that uh, hopefully at some point not too near in the future when middle schoolers are required to take band or have the choice of taking uh, band or choir, uh, we don't have to ask them to rent their instruments. Um, we are going to buy some additional wheels for the pottery lab right through this door here. We are going to also take a significant chunk of funds and rent some transportation so that if you have a boy who has a basketball game in South Denver, we can get him there the safest and most efficient way possible. Uh, turns out the school bus is the safest vehicle on the road. And I'm very interested to see how this is going to work out because I think carpool, carpooling creates community. Right? We're all in it together. We're struggling in traffic. I'll take your kid, you take mine. Um, so that piece isn't going to be there anymore, but I suspect the payoff will be much better uh, in the long run. If this works out, uh, you might see me stand up at a future meeting and say, we're going to buy some transportation. For right now, we're going to spend some money to rent it so we can see how it goes. Um, so that's gala funds. It's important for me and it's important for the Board of Trustees who authorize all of these funds or all of these expenditures that you see your philanthropic dollars put to work. And so this is an example. It's going to affect that in school at some point or another. Um, and we're grateful for that. So all told, out of a $75,000 net uh, gala, we're going to spend just over $50,000 on these initiatives this year so that we can really see this stuff in action. And you should see it and feel it starting in January. Okay. Yeah. This is not great. <laughs> yeah. So I mentioned we had, uh, we took an alumni survey. Uh, the, after graduation, after our seniors graduated this past spring. 
And I thought I would share some of the data with you. Uh, it's hard to get in touch with 18-year-olds. <laughs> and they don't always respond to emails or phone calls or even wrangling them right off the street and bringing them into school. So we sent out uh, 25 surveys or phoned 25 families. We've gotten 13 back, so you need to know it's a little over 50%. Um, this is just a sample of what a graduating class at BCD is up to. Uh, a lot of us, or a lot of you might be interested in the college acceptance list for the class of 2010. I'll read through it briefly. Uh, this is where our graduates are headed. Arizona State, Auburn, I shouldn't say this is where they're headed. This is where they were accepted. Arizona State, Auburn, Brown, Chapman, Colorado School of Mines, Colorado State, CSU Pueblo, Columbia Duke, Grand Canyon University, Indiana University, Lewis and Clark, Metropolitan State down in Denver, NYU, Northwestern, Pepperdine, Princeton, Southern Methodist, Texas A&M, Texas Christian, Tufts, UC Boulder, and the universities of Michigan, Nebraska, North Carolina, Northern Colorado, Oregon, Puget Sound, Tampa, Texas, Washington, Wisconsin, Wyoming, Utah, and Willamette University. So this gives you an idea of where our kids are heading after they graduate from high school. Here's what they told us about their high school experience. Of 13 students who responded to this question, 12 students reported taking AP or IB classes in high school, 12 out of 13. Three reported participating in the diploma program, either at IB diploma program, either at Fairview or at Nywalk. Of 11 students who answered this question, three students reported entering their high school foreign language program at level three. We'd like to say that our most able students will enter foreign language at level three or higher. Uh, eight at level two. Of nine students who answered the question, the average year of four, years of foreign language study is three. Extracurricular, we asked a lot about foreign language because we knew that's one of the things we need to focus on. Of 13 completed surveys, eight students reported that they were involved in clubs and activities in high school. Of 13 completed surveys, 12 students reported they participated in high school athletics. 12 out of 13 completed surveys. This is the one that warms my heart. It's a requirement here. Community service is a requirement at our school. It's not a requirement in, uh, in a lot of high schools. Of 13 students who answered the question, do you participate in community service in high school? 10 of them are doing it. The stuff that we're teaching in our character education program is working, and it has lasting effect into high school years and beyond. Uh, so that's just a smattering of some of the data that, that we collected. Uh, we got a lot of one-word answers and some incompletes, so we need to go back and collect more. But we're going to survey our alum every single year. It's an important measurement for us to consider, and we need to make sure we know whether or not they're feeling prepared, whether or not they're finding success in their schools, and how well their education in our school is aligning with their education at their school. So it's a critical piece of information for us. And each graduate last year got a copy of uh, Oh, the Places You'll Go. That's why I have it up there. <laughs> so preparing for next year. Uh, our preparations for next year actually started this year. Uh, we knew that some of the initiatives that we started this year were going to be multi-year initiatives. And so when we came back to our plans for next year uh, in September, which is essentially when the next school year starts, to start, uh, starts for us, uh, those of us who are on the administrative leadership team, uh, we think about these things carefully. So it started in September, and we take a holistic approach to planning for our next school year. That is to say, we have a whole bunch of wants and needs, and then we have the reality of enrollment and budgeting. So we have to try and find a way that we can do what we need to do, given the resources that we think we're going to have. And what we think in September might not be what we think in December, or what we think in March, or what we know in September. That's when the final budget gets passed for the year that actually funds the initiatives and plans that we have. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the budgeting process, uh, how we plan for the school year, and um, what next year's tuition is going to look like in these next few slides. Let's see if I can get there. So the first thing that we need to do is uh, we need to set the goals for the coming year. And uh, you saw these earlier on in, in my presentation. Uh, 
these are the goals that we work with when we're thinking about how can we make our school improve? How can we take it to that next level? We have to invest in our people. We have to support our faculty and staff. We have to improve our ability to differentiate. Many of you are at our school because of the individual level of instruction that we give your children. We can't fall through the cracks on that promise. We have to continue to push and push and push to make sure that we're delivering absolutely everything we can given the resources that we have. We want to make sure we extend, expand the depth and breadth of our educational program and where one thing might be new and important, another thing might not be as important anymore. We have to make those kinds of judgments. And we have to provide the resources and the facility that our faculty and staff need to complete goals one through three. So all of that goes into a hopper. And, um, and we take sort of a systematic look at each, each piece of it. The first thing we do is, given our goals, we estimate our expenses for the coming school year. And we ask our line item budget managers to do three different budgets. The first one is something terrible happens and uh, your school is in survival mode and you have to figure out what you're going to do to survive. We call that the survival budget. The second one is the status quo budget. How are you going to maintain the quality of your program from this year to next year? This is the already excellent programs that we have. What do we need to do to be able to fund them? And the third piece is what we call the reach budget. If you could do what you need to do, what would you need to fund that dream? That's what we're looking for. What would you need to fund that dream? We take all of those uh, budgets, and they're about, Emory 13 budget managers? Where are you, Emory? She's in here. So about 13, 12 or 13 of them? Okay, and we bring those into our administrative team leadership meeting, and we figure out, okay, where are the ways in which we might want to dream this next year? Where are the ways that uh, we want to uh, maintain what we have? And are there any ways that we can do what we want to do, except for we don't have to, to uh, fund it at the dream level? So all of us, and there are eight of us on this team, uh, sit down and we work through these uh, different expense scenarios. Then the next thing we have to do is estimate revenue. And like many independent day schools, the key driver of our revenue is enrollment. So we have to take a look at enrollment. And we look at enrollment this year, we look at historical trends for enrolling new students, we look at historical trends for attrition, who are we gonna lose? Uh, we look at who's currently in our admission funnel, we talk to each individual division director to try and get a sense of what's happening within the school. We know, for example, some people might be moving next year, so we take a look at that. And we put that all into an uh, enrollment spreadsheet, and we come out with an estimation of enrollment for the coming school year. And we use that estimation of enrollment to estimate our revenues. And then what we do is we set tuition based on our uh, enrollment and programmatic needs. So we kind of, all of that stuff goes into this sort of think tank, if you will. And knowing that we can pull different levers to make a couple of different things happen, uh, we do the best we can to, um, to keep costs low, to keep the education affordable, and to still provide the excellent uh, education that your children need and deserve. So, this past year when we did that, We got three different tuitions for the coming school year. The first, and the preschool tuition assumes you're going five days a week. It's not three days till one or three days till three or anything like that. Preschool tuition for next year, uh, 15,272. Elementary school, 16,290. And middle school, 18,036. This is inclusive of fees. You're no longer going to break out tuition and fees on our enrollment contract. It's insane. It's too much to keep track of. So this is inclusive of fees. These, this, these tuitions fund the operation of the school. There's no gap between revenue and expense. Uh, and all told, it's a 4.25% tuition increase, which is the lowest tuition increase we've been able to uh, project for you in the last 10 years, and maybe even beyond that. And just to give you a sense of what that looks like, this is what it looks like. These are our percentage tuition increases over the past 10 years. You can see the mean uh, for preschool is six and a half. You can't probably read that. Elementary, 5.8, middle, 5.6, okay? So we are beating our tuition increase average over time. And this is what a fully enrolled school can do. 
we don't have to increase tuition at the level that we increased in the past. But it comes with a note, an important note, and that is as our school becomes more desirable and our grades begin to fill, the January 31st deadline that we've set forever for the past however many years becomes more important to our current families. We want to make sure that we're saving a spot for you. So that January 31st deadline is key because we have people in the wait pool who are going to begin to get their acceptances and their admittances on January 31st. So a couple of things that I would say to that. Number one, every child here um, who, uh, it, yeah, I can just say, every, unless you've had a conversation with your division director, every child here has got a spot for next year, okay? That's a critically important piece. Number two, we want you to come back to our school. Uh, we think we've got a really great thing uh, going here, and we really want you to take advantage of that. And, and uh, I enjoy meeting all of you in Carline and in events like this and other places around the school day after day after day. So uh, we want you here. If you decide that this isn't the place for you or your circumstances are in flux, I don't know if I'm gonna get transferred next year, for example, we ask that you talk with Susan Boyle and she is able to maintain our current enrollment piece so we know who can we expect back, who might be on the fence, and then we can begin to make some decisions. So this is gonna be a critical piece for us this year. Um, we have some areas to explore for next year. They include uh, an elementary school that is going to get a refresh over the summertime. So we are going to go through that entire building, paint, carpet, flooring, the whole thing. And we're getting bids right now. Uh, so you can look forward to a newly painted and newly refreshed elementary school next year. A meeting with the elementary school teachers on Wednesday of this week to ask them, how do you want this to look? Do you want hardwood floors? Do you want carpet? Right now, they spend a lot of time eating in their classrooms, and I think that hardwood floors or flooring is way better than carpet. Uh, but we'll see what they say on Wednesday. Um, we also have a couple questions to answer, like what happens when middle school class size goes from 36, which is where it is in sixth grade now, to 42? How do we manage that, right? We can't have a class size of over 18, so we're gonna have to have, if we go that way, three different sections in middle school. How's that gonna impact our schedule? What's that gonna look like for English and science and history classes, not to mention foreign language and math classes? So that's an interesting question that we have. How do we continue to attract three-year-old and pre-K families for next year? Another interesting question. Uh, and do we have alignment, as I mentioned, from our self-study between mission and program? So all of these we will be looking at for next year. Uh, it's gonna be a great year, and I look forward to receiving your, uh, your enrollment contracts. And the last piece I have for you is, what is our school going to look like in the future? Uh, and a lot of that, a lot of those questions, uh, we don't have answered yet. I wanna tell you why. The Board of Trustees sets school strategic priorities. That's their job. They hold our mission and trust, and their job is to look out over the next five to seven years to envision the future for our school. Uh, but they need a lot of help in doing that. And we just got out of a board retreat in November where the board is committed to an inclusive strategic planning process that involves all of our constituencies. Parents, alumni, faculty and staff, trustees, hopefully get some students involved in that as well, alumni parents. So they're setting the course for the next five to seven years and that process is gonna start immediately after holiday break. And uh, I expect it to be an exciting process. Uh, the board's goal is to have that process finished by May. We'll see how that goes, uh, but that's our goal. Uh, but when we're getting the level of input and feedback that we hope, we anticipate that that's gonna be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, so you can expect to receive some surveys. You can expect to uh, answer some questions. You can expect to know the answers to those questions. And ultimately, you can expect something that looks kind of like this. Which was our last strategic plan. How many of you have seen this document? Yeah. Uh, this document was the work, a tremendous amount of work done by uh, a current parent, mostly, or led by a current parent, uh, named Victoria Kazai. Uh, she did a tremendous amount of work on this with the Board of Trustees about seven years ago. Uh, and our 
six points, our six plan, uh, planning points from seven years ago, elevate the school experience, foster a flourishing faculty, engage the entire community, grow our family of families, optimize school operations, and enhance and expand our campus. At the board retreat, our trustees spent some time going through each and every one of those priorities. And we found uh, in each one of those priorities evidence that we, in fact, did what we said we wanted to do. Uh, and so this is a remarkable process, and it's going to be a living, breathing document. We don't want this document to sit on a shelf. If I ask the same question to you next year, how many of you have seen our strategic planning document, my hope is that 95 to 100 percent of you would raise your hand. This is going to be the thing that guides us in our future. Okay? So that process will be coming up beginning in January. And last but not least, I thought I'd share with you what the future might look like for independent schools. This information came from the National Business Officers Association, it's called NBOA, and uh, they did some work in national trends in independent school education. Here's what they said. Uh, Advice to business officers. Remain vigilant on two fronts. Scrutinize budgets based on where your mission lives in them. Watch our missions, our unique value propositions within our markets. We happen to have the most scrutinizing business person in the world on our staff, and that's Anne-Marie Tui. She is, she, she drills down in our expense and revenue lines like you wouldn't believe. Uh, so I'm grateful to have Anne-Marie on our team. Um, secondly, only 6%, here's some other trends, only 6% of students are exposed to technology through a one-to-one -one program. 6%. 100% of our middle school students are exposed to technology through a one-to-one -one program. Gabe Hernan leads that effort. Thank you, Gabe. <laughs> Here's some thoughts for our marketing team. It's an article by Tom Price in this magazine. Independent schools need to sharpen their pencils regarding sustainable tuition increases. Our, tu our schools uh, tend, and this is the reason is because our schools tend to be in the same neighborhoods as high performing public schools. You betcha if you're from Boulder, Colorado. We think about this all the time. What is our value proposition and how can we ensure that our school is worth it to our families and our community? When you live in Boulder and you've got other high-performing schools, you have to be really clear on what it is you do. Many schools are assigning one member of their leadership team with the title Chief Innovation Officer. These folks are charged with encouraging, defining, designing, developing, assessing, or implementing innovative practices. We don't have a CIO at this point. I'm sure we can take nominees. Uh, here's one that I I'd, I'd like to focus on. The best marketing for independent schools is for their parents to be stark, raving fans. You are our best marketing in our school. You are our best marketing.